to the John <coughs> Building for this session on Ireland and the future of the European Union. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all, and I'm particularly delighted to welcome our guests from uh, the Institute of European and International Affairs in Dublin, uh, to welcome Paul Cunningham from RTE's The Week in Politics, and I'm delighted that we're going to be able to host a student-centred event where we um, have <coughs> students talking about their Europe, the Europe of the present and the future. I'm delighted also to link up with the Minister's uh, initiative launched yesterday on the Citizens' Dialogue. We'll be saying more about that as we go on. But for now, it's a pleasure to introduce the Director of the Institute for European and International Affairs, Barry Andrews. And Barry is just going to say a few words at the outset. Thank you, John. Uh, good, morning. good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be here today. Thank you, uh, John, and all the staff at Maynooth University for uh, uh, facilitating this meeting this afternoon. And thank uh, Paul Cunningham, not only of uh, the week in politics, but also of uh, Morning Ireland this morning. So uh, he nods off during the course of today <laughs> uh, with, with plenty of excuses. Let me first of all tell you what the IAA is. It is uh, Ireland's uh, leading think tank. We are focused on international affairs. Uh, we've been in existence for 30 years. We went from the Institute of European Affairs to the Institute of International and European Affairs. But our main focus at the moment is on Brexit on the one hand and the future of the Euro Europe 27 on the, on the other hand. Uh, normally what we do is we have meetings where thought leaders and experts and academics and politicians, policy makers, they come in and they give a speech. Well, we've changed that around today because we want to engage uh, our citizens in this discussion. I'll explain a little bit why. So, if the upheaval of the last few years has taught liberal elites like myself anything at all, is that any po policy initiative that is not firmly rooted in real and broad public dialogue it is destined for failure. I am an enthusiast for the European project, but I was in politics myself uh, long enough to know that good policy gets much better through proper immersion in public dialogue. It is in this spirit that the European Union has now emerged, dazed, it has to be said, from some of its most difficult times to turn not to its member states but to its citizens. The EU has come through a period when its very survival was far from guaranteed, suitably chastened and contrite now, now seems, seeks to summon fresh energy through a consultative public dialogue. This is not to provide a separate uh, or parallel legitimacy from that which derives from the treaties of the European Union and the institutions. It's not a comment on the existing democracies of the European, uh, of the European Union. Rather, it is to acknowledge the reality that if you don't plan the battle, you will battle the plan. And Europe wants to engage uh, with its citizens in order to plan that battle. Whatever brings people to the debate, whether it is intellectual curiosity or enlightened self-interest, the more they take part, the better. However, no one is under any illusion that the EU will be on the tip of everyone's tongue, but not being able to do everything, not being able to involve everything, should not be an excuse to do nothing. Politicians have been guilty of Europeanizing failure and nationalizing success. Yesterday, uh, Minister Covey pointed out yesterday that while people see the EU as too remote, they also feel that it interferes too much in their lives. So it is in this spirit that the teacher launched the Citizens' Dialogue that John mentioned uh, yesterday. It is in this spirit that President Macron called for a democratic dialogue across the entire continent of Europe. And it is in this spirit that the IAEA uh, has brought together this panel today, because we want to hear the views of students, of young people, of our citizens uh, throughout Ireland and develop a proper response to uh, the challenges that I've just outlined. The European Commission itself has also posed questions for citizens in a couple of initiatives that have emerged over the last year. The first is the White Paper, which was produced by President Juncker, and they set out a few scenarios for how the European Union might develop. For example, I won't go through them all, do we just stay as we are, stand still, do no more, uh, continue the way we have been for the last while? Or do we pair back to just the single market? Forget about all the other uh, competences that the European Union has developed over the last few years. Or do we allow some countries to go faster and others to stay 
still, in other words, a multi-speed Europe. That's the kind of scenarios that the European Union has now asked the citizens to think about. Not because it thinks one of the scenarios should stand out over any others, but just as a debating point to bring people into the dialogue. It has also issued a number of reflection papers on specific issues like globalization, um, the social dimension of the European Union, and the EU's finances. And they are also a way for people to come into this debate. So that's the context. Um, I, I'll, I'll stop at that. I want to now uh, hand over to, uh, to Paul and to your panel. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, I thought it would probably be a good idea to have a very general conversation. Um, so rather than getting into detail, but I've tried to get what people's opinions are. And if we divide it up into two parts, one is what is Europe to you? What does it mean? And then into the second part of what could change. So if we actually get a sense of what people think of it, then we get some understanding of how the EU has projected itself up to now. And then as it moves forward, what could or couldn't change. But I think it would be unfair to ask these six people to start talking about those themes without saying something about myself. So just uh, very shortly, I wanted to bring, um, I brought two props with me. Uh, this is the first one. It's a very dramatic piece. And this is something I managed to knock out of the Berlin Wall in December of 1989 because I wanted to be a journalist, I wanted to travel, and Eastern Europe was falling apart, so I managed to borrow some money, bus, train, train, bus, hitched, managed to get to Berlin at 8pm, December the 31st. I was sitting on a wall with a guy from Leipzig, and I spoke German a little bit, he spoke um, English a little bit, and between his hooch that he produced in his back garden and my cigarettes, <laughs> we spoke and spoke and spoke about what was happening in front of us, and uh, every now and again he'd stop mid-conversation say, I just can't believe this. And for me, that was a sort of a defining moment for my relationship with Europe, this idea of democracy, of freedom of expression, <coughs> of freedom of speech, of journalism, of collaboration. These were huge themes for me um, that sort of informed my view of European cooperation and that idea of pooling sovereignty. Um, the other thing, um, the other problem brought is this <coughs> in my head. And the reason I pointed out was four years later, in 1993, I was in uh, 1993 and 1994, I was reporting from Bosnia. And I was in um, the Bihać pocket in western Bosnia, which is a small pocket about the size of County Bicklin, which was surrounded on all sides. And there were army up in the hills, and they were indiscriminately shooting down on the people who were inside in the pocket. And people with long uh, sights, rifles, high power, and they were just waiting for someone to move. Bang. And that night, and it was a Friday night, I went down and there was a disco on down, which they were having down at a car park in a bunker. So even though they were under siege, they still had a disco. And there was one girl who was talking to the translator, and then she went out and she was dancing on the floor, and she was giving it large. And I was talking to the translator, and I said, gosh, it's really, it's a really impressive, you know? Because it was sort of early in the disco, so everyone else was by the sides, against the wall, that was dramatic. And um, Dika was the translator, and what she said to me was that her brother was shot dead on Wednesday. But um, she said, they can take my brother, but they can't take my Friday. So she was in the disco on the Friday night, and she was basically giving a two fingers to those who had been up in the hills. And once again, that was the second theme for me, which is the question of um, peace. And the European project is a project for peace. And uh, that too was resonant with me. But I'm 48, so I'm going to be 49 next month. So those ideas of democracy, of cooperating together, of peace, I don't think have got that much relevance to today. So I think for us now to get a sense of where Europe is going to go, we need to understand how people see Europe now, the good bits and the bad bits, but also then how we can change it within the dialogue that Barry just spoke about. So we've got six fantastically brave people here who are going to offer their opinions, but they're not on the rack. We're just going to be asking them what their views are, but then opening it up to yourselves if you have any strong views. So what I wanted to do was maybe start off and just by whoever wants to take up the cudgel and say what Europe means to you, either the good bits or the bad bits, and just to kick it off. Because you're closest. <laughs> <laughs> nice call. Um, well, I understand that Europe was about peace originally, and that that's where it was founded. And, but to be honest, that it feels a little bit like history. I, I was born in 1996. I've never known anything other than a peaceful Europe that's cooperated with one another. And I re remember barely just about the accession to the, to the East and Poland, but it's not something that's significant. Just kind of for me, they've always just been there. So when people talk of peace, I appreciate it and I understand it, but I don't really feel it. So for me, what Europe is, is, is opportunity. 
it's opportunity for <coughs> kind of Irish people to go abroad, live abroad, work abroad, for people to come here and experience our culture, for us to get involved in on a global stage through kind of you know the the rotating presidency of the EU Council through our MEPs and and things like that. It's, it's it's opportunity for our politicians to have influence on the global stage. It's opportunity for our citizens. It's it's just it's opportunity. That's the one word that sums up Europe for me. It's the opportunity of a, a brighter, broader future. But you just maybe go down the line on this one, maybe Will you just also give it if, if it's more or less the same point you can just pass on, but if there's anything you have just about that concept of what is Europe for you? Um Mostly my experience in Europe, I um, have my little burgundy book in my hand, hop on the plane, go anywhere. Um, and then I agree that um, to have a voice in the world stage and some shout that come Ireland's way as a result of outside influence that maybe wouldn't happen had we not have had those voices uh, in our country. Uh, yeah, I think call the right opportunity to uh, visit other countries, experience other cultures. Um, but I think the societal impact that Europe has had on Ireland um, from its laws and regulations and the, the values of Europe have been important and they can continue to be important in the future, like equal pay for women or LGBT <coughs> rights, uh, things like that. Uh, yeah, there was an awful lot of sense that an awful lot of those rules from Europe actually delivered for us, whether it was rights-based culture or whether, even things on the environment. As someone who's environment correspondent for 10 years, we often felt that if it hadn't been from an edict for Brussels, things would never would have happened. Um, but if we're talking about sort of opportunity, if we're talking about jobs, if we're talking about, as I say, sharing and uh, things not feeling isolated, what, is there anything else, Anastasia, that you feel that Europe is a benefit and offers? Because maybe years ago, it was a really simple binary answer. We get more from the EU monetarily than we give in, so therefore, thumbs up to being a member of Europe? Um, well, I'd agree with all of the speakers and actually what you said also about the environmental impact because I don't think that Ireland, I think, can be, we're more of a reactive kind of lawmaking as opposed to proactive. Like, we understand that there are problems there, but unless we're faced with those on the international scale, we don't necessarily have the political ingenuity to go for it. But um, in relation to what Europe would mean to me, it was definitely like the development of the rights based culture that we actually um, received from our um, accession into Europe. And then I'd also question the um, relationship of peace in Europe because well, now I'm a little bit older. <laughs> but um, I do think the accession process, it's been more acknowledged now that um, possibly in the mass accession when it was that the rule of law was more of a question because we've seen kind of like instances maybe in Poland and Hungary at the moment that are kind of slightly controversial, I'd imagine is kind of more like putting it. But um, I think um, the fact that Europe has realise that and is reiterating the fact that the importance of rule of law in say the Copenhagen criteria and the accession process um, and the fact that Ireland has an input into that especially on an international scale is fantastic because we definitely would get that on our own without membership of an international organisation. Yeah I mean I think that's one of the big things about how as we begin to move forward we also have to look back on ourselves and if we're looking about Europe as a project of peace as you said the history well, we're now looking at you know closer military cooperation. We're also looking at our involvement with other countries. So that does raise ethical questions about what is it that we want from it? What is it? Where are we actually going to go to? Um, just once again, but before we go into the future, just your sense of the positive or negative view you have of Europe. Well, Michelle. my view is that, well, I was not born here. Um, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I was not born here. I, I moved here in 2001. I am uh, British by birth. And I'm also French by natural well, by ascendancy. So in a sense, I, I suppose for me, it's a bit of an identity crisis. So it's been like that for me <laughs> on a personal level. You know, you know, where is my home? I mean, I consider it my home. But for me, the idea of being European, and it only came to me later, this sense of being European, it's an idea of I can appreciate that I have privileges and I have protections and rights that other people in the world do not. I like, uh, sorry, what's your name? The second speaker? Nave. Nave, Nave, sorry, my, my apologies. Um, like you said, the, you know, you can take a passport and you can go to anywhere in the European Union. It's a sense of, and, I, and I've been to, I went to Belgium back in January and I went to Hungary and uh, Slovakia in March and I could do that no problem at all. And I still felt 
that's something I really value. That I can I can go there, I can live there, I can retire there, I can I can study there through Erasmus, for example. And I just that's that's a personal thing, but it's it's something that that's what Europe is to me. That's what the European Union is to me. And I don't feel <coughs> that in a nationalist kind of way. I don't feel that being European makes me better than someone, but it makes me appreciate it more than more than. Yeah, I mean, I think that things like um, the Brexit have actually forced us to begin to think about what Europe is, to a certain extent, to be being passive and haven't had to. But now that, say, something like the United Kingdom, the Brexit is beginning to move away, it's forced us, well, what do we want? And it's actually quite an interesting time, a provocative time, where we're getting all sorts of ideas about where we might go. But as you said, Barry talked about maybe one of the options is to strip everything back to just an economic model, or we're just... You know, going back to the EEC, just the idea of trade and leaving everything else out. But from what we're hearing already, there's that sense of we do value the idea of being able to travel anywhere, <coughs> being able to get a job anywhere, and not having to go through all of those difficulties. You can just get on the plane and go. Yeah, so you think that's in the market as well. So if you strip back, like you talk about the Norway model, well, the Norway model wasn't was modelled on what Norway's circumstances were. You don't consider it's no one size fits all scenario. Yeah. For, 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 so. As I say, Norway's a brilliant example for Norway. Um, Sienna, what's your sense of that? I kind of feel like on the supranational level, it's brilliant because it connects all these member states and all these people within the member states. As Michael said, like gave him a sense of identity, and it's great <coughs> that we can hop on a plane and go wherever and get a job and live there and like commit to like their processes and you know. But I feel on a social level, people don't know what the EU actually does. Like we're lucky enough to have the education to tell us, right, so this is what the EU is, this is the economic policy, the social policy. <coughs> if you ask any other Joe Soap on the street, well, they'll have a, a rough idea, but they won't know. And that's why we feel like maybe there's a lower turnout in like, voting for European elections and MEPs. Yeah, um, so I feel like they're there, but they're like a foreign body to certain people, and they kind of need to make their presence a bit more felt, possibly in a, a positive way. Because at the moment in Ireland we're looking at things like the Apple tax crisis and um, some people are like, oh it's positive because the EU are enforcing directives and, and rules, but people are like, well it's jeopardising our, our um, foreign investments, our, our foreign companies and all this, so it's really not a good thing for Ireland at the same time. So I feel like if they were there more socially, we'd have more educated opinions on these things and in terms of referenda <coughs> and voting for MEPs probably excel more. I mean, that, that issue of information is huge. I mean, I was the uh, Europe correspondent for RT for five years. So I was based in Brussels trying to deal with the deluge of information which is lashed at you every single day. And take, for example, yesterday, um, Minister of State Patrick O'Donovan was at the General Affairs Council in Brussels. But I'd say, is there anyone in the room who knows what Patrick O'Donovan was doing yesterday? So I think there is a... Does Patrick O'Donovan? <laughs> 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 no, that's not. Thank you. Um, so I think there is an issue, a, a need for the minister to communicate back, and then there's also the responsibility on media and their duty of informing people in an unbiased manner as to what's happening as well. So that's a, a current issue. But just before we go to the floor, and just ask other people to join us, just on that question of the future, is there anyone who's got particularly strong views on what way they believe the... Europe should be going. One of the questions Barry posed is, um, and it's something which echoed uh, what Jean Claude Juncker was speaking about in his direction. He was saying Europe needs to do the big things better and get out of the small stuff. So if it's got a, an overview, a direction to where it's going, that's good, but what it shouldn't be doing is fiddling around in member states and just getting people's backs up. So that was one analysis. But what's your sense? What would be um, a key point? And I won't go up and down the panel. I'll just ask if anyone has particularly strong views. Um, as to what the EU should be doing, what the future should look like. I think on the white paper that um, Barry mentioned, we should be going towards the fifth scenario of doing more together. Um, but before we can do that, uh, the communication has to be uh, sorted out from Europe as to what their goals are, why they're doing it, and how they're going to get there. Um, because if people don't understand that, well, then they have this negative Eurosceptic view of. European Union. Um, for example, we had somebody giving a guest lecture yesterday, I can't remember his name, um, and he was the head of the European Parliament office in Dublin, and he said that uh, during election time, the European Parliament has an information campaign about what they do, but they should really be doing that continuously, so that people understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Yeah. <coughs> Anyone else? 
like you said, like that they want to focus more on the, the bigger things and get out the small things, but how can they commit to the bigger things if they haven't got all the small things in mind? Like it's it's really like the many make the one rather than the one completes the many. So like if you're looking at in each individual country, like how can they enforce um, single market if people are going against the directives against um, corporation law and stuff like that within the EU? So they have to look at the small things before they can look at the big thing as an overall picture. So the baby steps and then you can start by? I think the same thing which you mentioned in your pre-statement, like I agree that the EU needs to assert itself more. We need more people like Bushlaga in being able to say, sorry, what you're doing is contrary to what you're obliged <coughs> to do. Yeah. And you need more and it does need to assert itself, not just in that not just in that manner, but also in communication as well. I feel like I don't think that there's a communication deficit, an information deficit. I think the information is there in spades. On you, like you can type in Europe and you find all the information there. But like your average Joe on the street is not going to know that. I mean, my joy the question: Does your average Joe on the street know much about Irish? How good Irish are in Irish? But uh, it is a media issue as well. It is something you mentioned the media bias as well. The fact that the media in oh, which country oh, will media bias at all. <laughs> 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 but uh, in. Um, in the case of the United Kingdom in particular, it is the, the fact that there is no civic education per se, or not enough civic education of how we communicate it to people, how processes work, how politics works at institutional levels, rather people hear it mostly through the media. I mean, I think that's a, the media is always going to be one of the picking up Barry here again. He touched on it in his speech where he spoke, spoke about, I said, all shifting with like back on that way. Um, when he spoke about politicians nationalizing success, and internationalizing failure. So when it works, it's all down to them. And when it all goes horribly wrong, they say it's bad Brussels and they've got it wrong. So there's a, and then when a journalism, when a journalist is reporting and reporting what's said, um, not necessarily always getting the editorial context to it, and so messages get pushed without necessarily the full context being delivered to the audience. And in the, in the world of Breitbart and Fox and yeah. everything else, I think we're getting so much information, but being actually able to discern the truth of it is hard, and that also comes back to lecturers and being able to give us all the critical thinking so you're able to discern for yourself as to what what you're being told, why you're being told, and by you, and being able to make an educated um, guess on it. But it's a massive challenge. But just maybe just from the audience point of view, just on that opening thing of where we should be going, and um, what's your sense of it? Um, I'm a secondary school teacher here, just next door, and uh, just introduced in the school this year this new program called the European Parliament Ambassador School Program, basically to, to raise awareness among our young people, you know, what is the EU and what is the European Parliament? Now, you know, there was a huge response, uh, there was an application process for the students to get involved in this, and there were more applicants in the more places, so we had to... Um, we had to read their application form and the reasons they gave for wanting to do the program. It was quite astonishing, the, the extent of interest among them. And also their concern about the future of Europe, the, the, the fears that it's all going to fragment and what's going to happen. Are we going to be isolated out here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean again, all on our own? But there has been you know, a very, very, um, a very strong response from those young people. They are interested. They want to learn more. And, and they want to get involved. So I think this is a great opportunity for them, this new program. This is only the second year, it was piloted just national, uh, nationally last year. But just then on a personal level, I, my, my grievance with the, with the Irish um, approach to the European Union has been that I, I don't feel they have been there shaping the direction of Europe. It's been too much emphasis on what can we get out of it. And I think that has to change. You know, we've got we've got to you know take our place strongly in Europe as leaders with a vision, mm. rather than as people who are looking to, to grab as much money as we can. If I can go then back to the panel and just on one of the sort of big issues which um, John mentioned at the top was the question of Brexit, and obviously it's a, a complicated and sometimes nasty debate that's happening. But is there anything positive that comes from it? If even the question that we begin to think of why we are in the European Union and what the benefits are. Anyone have a view on that? Just in relation to actually it's, it's yeah. linking your question and the lady's um, statement there, is that I think it's actually given us an opportunity, it's given Ireland an opportunity to come out from behind, say, Britain's shadow and to take a stance <coughs> and to lead on our own to show that we are innovative, innovative 
thoughtful leaders and that we can make a difference, even though we are such a small country, that our inputs are important. So even the red line stance that will take on, say, the partition, um, and the border patrol or non-border patrol or however that plays out, I think it's vital that Ireland play a really strong role in that and then really start to dig out our own like, um, foundations in Europe and build on what we've already, we already have a good reputation in Europe, but we just need to build on it and show that we are not just followers or leaders. Because the, the, say for example the Department of Foreign Affairs would look uh, point to its white paper and say well say things like hunger that's something that is an Irish priority. They would point to things like the death penalty and say that's something they oppose. They have taken on things like human rights defenders and say that they're going to push that and it's diplomatic things. But I guess uh, I think that uh, those general nodding of heads here, that's, uh, when you say Ireland's leading a debate, <coughs> you just don't see it. Um, so is that something that you know here we could be doing, which would once again give a more of a reference and a profile for Ireland and the European Union? Well, I totally agree with Anastasia that it does, and I know a certain colleague in the audience who has spoken to me about this, who has said that Ireland, this actually does give Ireland an opportunity mm -hmm. to take a stance and to, to form new alliances and to, mm -hmm. to assert itself within the European Union and globally, more so than just, as uh, the lady said, just seeing what can we get out of this, really, you know, we're in it for an economic issue. I think Ireland took a, has taken for too long a similar approach to as the British have in seeing what is our agenda in all of this, rather than seeing what can we give back to it, what can we actually engage in, because we have a seat at this table. Um, and I think, uh, I lost my train of thought, but um, I think that, for example, uh, the Taoiseach, Leo Bradford, whatever you might say about it, his uh, visit to France and saying that France will be Ireland, was it Ireland's most important ally after Britain leaves? I think that that's quite true, especially when you look at areas such as agriculture that France will be, France, as one example, will be of primary importance as an ally. And I think that that's a positive sign. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that France has been, when it came to agriculture, I mean, we sometimes are viewed as being tied to the Brits, but it wasn't really true. There was lots of different alliances going on. And I certainly think that from Varadkar's point of view, associating himself with Macron reflects a European view that Macron is the real deal. And he's the person who's going to be pushing. And if you're going to be associated with anyone, he's the one you want to be at. But Oh, did you want to get in there? Um, I, just, I just wanted to say that I think whatever hope we have is, is around the European table. Um, like when Shane Ross, I, if, he, if he goes to see Kim Jong Un, um, <laughs> I don't think he's going to have. A whole, I don't think he's going to have a whole lot of luck in terms of influencing policy or anything like that. But when he sits around the European Council table, he does. He's one of the twenty-seven that will be left, and his voice will be heard and has to be listened to. And I suppose that just commands respect and influence in itself. I read in the white paper there that by 2060, the EU 27 are going to be less than 4% of the world population. If that, and that I, that's why I'd like to see Europe kind of do more together, I suppose, scenario five as it was in the paper. Because if that 4% if that isn't coherent within itself, and then you're at risk of being left behind. And the world and break countries, you know, uh, passes out and move on. I think we were talking about how Ireland could project towards the European Union. If you look at the other way about how Brussels projects itself back into Ireland. I mean, the big, or one of the big stories of the past couple of weeks was the Apple tax issue. And how did that, how did you see that, you know, uh, someone important in Brussels telling Ireland, you're wrong and we're going to get you. Um, how did that play out? How did you see the messaging coming from Brussels? Just to you, Shane. Um, I think if, uh, I think if, uh, countries' rules or tax codes are um, advantaging multinational corporations, then the Commission should step in and stop it. Um, because ultimately it's, it's distorting the common market, but it's also, um, it's, it's also against the citizens of that country and the European Union should be about nation states and the citizens of the nation states. Anyone else? Does anyone see it as sort of maybe a negative thing? Or? Well, I see it as a, a bit of a negative thing because like the ECG or ECJ are just there to like arbitrate and they're doing their jobs in a sense where like they're saying well we haven't taken it you had the opportunity to take it and now we're forcing you to take a, a fraction of it or whatever um, and we went and we appealed it <coughs> in my view would be a, a waste of the taxpayers money because think about the portion even if we don't get the whole amount think the portion that we have and what it can like go towards in terms of like we're facing homeless crisis 
the whole thing about abortion, the whole uh, water bills, um, and then there you have our TVs taking extra pay rises and everything. So like that money could be used towards helping us reshape Ireland and make it a more positive place, especially with Brexit and in the way like. Yeah. Anyone else want to come in on that one? Just because it was running for a while. Yeah, just on the tax case. Um, I thought it was a great thing. Um, as an Irish politician, when you're dealing with a company as, as big as Apple, who have a turnover probably the same size as our whole economy, if not bigger, it can be it can be difficult to turn around and say, look, I'm going to make this decision that's going to hurt you, because they have they have sway, they employ however many thousands, and they contribute so much to our GDP and, and all that. And then and then this this woman from Europe came in and did us a massive favour, and she ruled against them, and, and we didn't have to take credit for making that decision that hurt Apple, and, and we kind of threw back in their face and said, no, we'll appeal it, and I just, I just thought she did us a massive favour, and I find our tax policies hard to defend sometimes as well, like when you're talking to students from the continent, it's, it's not something I'm really comfortable with, the fact that we are a bit of a tax haven. But if, it, if you take it that um, one of the arguments is, is that because we're so small and because we're so peripheral, that we need to have some advantage over a power house like France, and on that basis, Europe needs to be flexible enough to be allowed until you know, some federal nirvana down the road, that Europe needs to be flexible enough to allow Ireland to have some sort of competitive advantage to attract. Otherwise, everything will rush to the centre and the periphery will be left behind. Does that carry any weight? It does. And to be honest, I don't really have a coherent response to that. But um, I just, I think that, you know, in a time when, you know, you see homelessness and the water charges and all that, and then... Mm -hmm. And then we try and defend the fact that we're not taxing these corporations at all, and they're here and they're benefiting from our infrastructure, and they need to contribute their fair share. Maybe we don't need to charge them. Maybe there doesn't need to be tax harmonisation of twenty percent across the EU. If we got like the twelve and a half percent, we might be doing well. Yeah, and I take that point very much. That in some cases, if you're small, you don't feel that you can stand up to a corporation. But if you're able to avail of mm. Europe to do the the bad boy business for you, then it's actually an advantage. I mean, one of the most controversial things is going to be, I would imagine, the security policy into the future. And, uh, you know, we've always said that we're neutral, but when you ask people about what our neutrality was, it seemed to be somewhat flexible as well, far from principle we were. I remember um, for the first time uh, when Irish forces were working under the Partnership for Peace and under NATO direction, it was in, in the former Yugoslavia, and I was deployed with them for a while. So once again, I was seeing Ireland move we had a triple lock, you know, we have to have a pass by the door that has to be passed by the UN Security Council, but we're just beginning to look out and beyond a bit what we may want to do. What do you want for Ireland to do in the context of Europe, its internal security and its borders? Well, in the wake of um, Brexit, like, depending on how the border pans out, if there is one, if there isn't, we're definitely going to need a heavier security than we already have. Um, also depending on what way like the Good Friday Agreement works out in terms of everything. But within the white paper it basically says that like they're gonna share information and, and help each other <coughs> within the member states. But really what can they offer us in terms of Brexit, in terms of like security? How will they help us? How will like they come to our aid? Will it be financial? Will it be military aid? Will it be like the way they had the, the person from America come over to instigate like the Good Friday Agreement, and then what can we give back to them? So like obviously France and Germany and, and Brussels have horrible incidents from terrorism, and being peacekeepers, is that all we can really do? Just keep peace, or is there a way that we can intervene and kind of help prevent these horrible terrorist attacks? Yeah, I mean it's interesting that the other red car is due to go to Mali. Um, in the coming weeks, and that's in relation to Irish Defence Forces who are down there at Bamako. So uh, that's one thing where we are already sort of working around the world. Is there anything that anyone ha feels strongly that we should be neutral, and this is like a red line? Or are we being more flexible and say, like you were saying, there's a give and take, that we will go here on the basis that we're going, there's going to be some reciprocal arrangement. Does anyone feel have very strong views on it? I think, that, like, you, <coughs> excuse me, like you said, that. Uh, Ireland's neutrality, in my view anyway, is always, as you said, flexible, but I think it's always been a bit vague here and there. I mean, you can only just point to the airport in Shannon, the, the US airbase. I mean, it's, there's a, it's, it's always been a bit uh, of a facade, in my view. And I think that Ireland's security and future security concerns actually fall into that greater European question of European defence. And 
it's uh, that I think, okay, Ireland's not a member of NATO. It, it, it hasn't, but I think that the future of NATO itself is in question in the sense that the current US president's ambiguity over his ambivalence over whether he supports NATO or not. Uh, mind you, I think that that's been a long, uh, long time in making. It has been an ambiguity mm -hmm. in the US. So I think that a European defense community is on the cards, not a European army. Like I'm not talking about one force by one, one rule. I'm talking about integrating militaries and sharing information, security, information, and intelligence. I think that that is very much on the cards, and I think Ireland needs to strongly consider it, especially in light of terrorist attacks, because terrorist, terrorism, uh, might, it might seem like a distant thing here. A lot of people said, <coughs> I was writing the paper one time, and someone said, uh, because it said actually that uh, armed guard units were being deployed to certain cities. And in light of the London terrorist attacks, and someone said, uh, oh, but I don't understand. We never colonized anyone. Why would anyone want to attack you? And I, <laughs> and I was like thinking, clearly this, this person doesn't, doesn't realize that this is a global issue. This is not something to do. This isn't like the IRA attacking Britain. This is a global terrorist issue. And this is something that we really need to, to consider. And I think, was it, was it Baradka who said himself, he was considering establishing a Cobra-style committee with the yeah. government? So I think, and I think that's a positive sign. And I think it is interlinking with European defense. I mean, for many, it used to be an article of faith, this idea of Ireland, we were independent. And on that basis, it allowed us, as a country which never colonized, to be able to go out and integrate with other people. It gave us a position of principle, gave us a capacity to be able to negotiate. But in the modern world, and looking towards the next 20 or 30 years, maybe that's, as you mentioned, in response to my great idea of Europe, maybe that's history too. Does anyone have? Well, I would just. Uh, just Good to want to get. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, just in relation to terrorist attacks and the Irish neutrality question, like there is flexibility on Irish neutrality, obviously, because peacekeeping, even within the UN, was never necessarily declared in the Charter of the UN. But we've managed to find a way in which to use our neutrality and peaceful status within the global community, not just the EU to go into areas of severe conflict and manage to be observers, peaceful observers, to try and maintain some kind of ceasefire or threshold of peace. And I do think that there is an importance of sharing information technology. I think that needs to be transnational, like there can't be borders on that. But the use of force, I think, particularly in international law, the definitions of terrorism, the use of force against non-state militant actors, it's very difficult to define. So to gain some legal threshold or legal stance on Ireland's neutrality without defining kind of their parameters on terrorism and on state militant actors, I think we're jumping the gun a bit. Do you know, I think we need to really define it internationally, then filter it down and have a full, proper negotiation and not just attack each other's neutrality because use of force should always be the end, like it should be after um, exercising all other um, possibilities. It's, it's definitely a last ditch attempt. Like. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just noticed that talking about security, people mean internal security, terrorist threat, but nobody mentioned Russia and its hybrid warfare, and I think it's a serious question, so what members of the panel think, think about this? I think it's absolutely... Uh, great point. I would have, Russia, was, Russia would have been my other consideration in terms of security. I think that uh, a European Defence Association, or whatever you want to call it, an alternative to NATO, a successor to NATO, is strongly important, especially when you look at the relationship between, well, the, again, ambivalence of Trump towards the likes of Putin, his you know, seeming aloofness when it comes to you know, Russian aggression especially in Ukraine, I'm not saying that the situation in Ukraine is black and white, but, and also, when, uh, sorry, not just Russia, but also when you consider uh, Turkey uh, and the Sultan <coughs> that was Erdogan resurging his power and attempting to, attempting to essentially, I think, um, say to Europe, you know, we don't need you anymore, we can do it our own way, and that, it's, it's a sense of, I think, we're starting to see a resurgence of hegemony in, poli in global politics. And do you think that, I'm um, just wondering as we're talking about this, do you think, because not only security brings back the actual border and the border of Europe and how we're going to, uh, is it something where it remains within the competence of the states and you're going to have different rules in different places as we saw along the Mediterranean? Because when Guy Hofstadt was in the Irish Parliament dealing mainly with Brexit, one of the big things he had as a, as a strong federalist was that we need to have some logic that's simply illogical to have. <coughs> 
different nation states with different borders, with different forces operating differently, that you need to have uniformity. And so, because this touches on the issue, obviously, of migration, another huge controversial issue. So that seems to be taking a step further down the road. Once again, of, <coughs> that what Europe needs to do is to integrate, um, to have that more collective operation for it to be more streamlined. And if you go that far, maybe you're talking about some form of federalism. Is that something that Europe should be doing? They attempted it once and it didn't work out, but maybe that wasn't the right era that they needed it. Maybe now, with everything going on in the world, with terrorism, with uh, refugee crisis, everything like in terms of, as Michael said, along the border, <coughs> Russia, to Ukraine, maybe we do need a, a form of a European defence community. Maybe not in the form of an actual army, but in something where it's like you can have a, a squad force that go out um, with different people from different member states and obviously intellectually sharing information about suspects and yeah. ongoing situations within each country. Because there is a responsibility on us. In um, February of 2014, I was in Kiev when 100 people were shot dead in the streets in one day. And part of that argument was over an offer that Europe had made to Ukraine. And there was a responsibility, as the Ukrainians thought, or at least those who were demonstrating in the Maidan, that there was a responsibility on Europe to deliver on its promises. And they felt that Europe welched on it. And so there is always a danger of overreach in any plans that we may have, in the signals that we send out. And that does, as you said, I think it was Anastasia, but you need to sort of pull back first and have like a, a logic to it and then be able to apply it. As otherwise, if you overreach, you can end up in and deep trouble really quickly. Yeah, because actually just on the um, the uniformity across all of the EU, although I do understand something like maybe a type of security defence force or uh, maybe EU security council or something of that nature, maybe less than the detail. But, uh, <laughs> um, I do kind of think that if we kind of, if Europe came out and made a statement that Europe was going to push towards complete uniformity across all member states, um, I think it'd be rejected straight out. I don't think it'd get through. Um, I do think that there was mass, a massive like um, positive push with the UNCRPD and um, managing to be um, ratified by the EU and then obviously, but it's because of the power I think of the EU law within the member states, the fact that it is going to be screened. And I think people, if they, they feel that they're losing their sovereignty in a quick bash, they're going to just do the knee-jerk reaction and pull out or attempt to pull back. And I think we've seen that with the UK. We're because, taking control. Do you know, yeah, and, and I think to, to detrimental effects, do you know, so I think yeah. this softly, softly, like as, as has ever been seen in international um, forums or international communities, soft law, although lawyers and different people can speak that it's not, um, it's not strong enough and it doesn't work, well, it, it does, it just works slowly. Okay, I've just noticed we've got about five minutes left before I'm going to hand back over to um, to John. Um, maybe just because we've been dealing with some of the really difficult and intractable problems that Europe has been facing over the last three or four years, lighten the mood a little bit. And we were talking earlier on the beginning about our allies, and <coughs> who we like and who should be in our club. Now that Britain has left, who should we be sort of um, reaching out to? France was mentioned as one great nation. Um, anyone else got any particular ideas about who we should be panning out uh, with? Like Leo Varadkar was up meeting um, the Dutch um, only recently. He also was in great state himself in Vine, so he was moving east as well, so he needs to have others. Anyone else got ideas about who we should be? Denmark. Denmark? <laughs> Denmark is a terrible example. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we let that pass. Um, anyone else? Potentially Germany. Because like Germany are like a leading economic thing in the uh, country in the EU and there's basically viewpoints that Germany and France kinda of run the EU as it is. So if we lead or if you join up with countries in terms of economic trade that we feel are economically strong, then we might get some there. Yeah, it's interesting that our teacher has gone to the Paris, but he hasn't gone to Berlin. And um, now maybe that's something to do with government formation, but still it's interesting that Canada got his and Berlin didn't. Um, anyone else? Just, um, just socially, I yep. think it'd be quite interesting for maybe Belgium. You know, they, they have a lot of human rights and social mm -hmm. um, policies and social dimensions. And Ireland is obviously in the last couple of years, maybe 
I don't know whether I could say it's right or wrong. It's, it's you know, we've made strides in certain human rights um, forums. And I think, like, locally we are recognised as, like, you know, particularly with the equality um, in marriage. And I think that maybe that we could build on, like, our social importance, social conscious and human rights defenders um, with the likes of, you know, maybe some of the Scandinavians or in Arabic, Belgium, you know, just to, to kind of create a partnership and stronghold maybe. I mean, Belgium is fascinating just because if you go into, say, some of the Flemish towns, the only place you will see a national flag is hanging off the outside of the um, state building in the little town because there's actually a legal requirement for them to do it. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, you don't see no Belgian flag. But I think as well, Belgians take a more pragmatic approach to the EU as well. Like it's, well, perhaps there are, I mean, perhaps to a degree it's value driven, but as well, I think there's a in economic terms and so socioeconomic terms they take a pragmatic approach but really at the heart of it Belgium would be a fragmented yeah. uh, identity really it's Flemish or so Maeve I haven't come back to you I was just wondering from you your idea of once again that future and where we want to go what would you sort of your thing you would most like to see um, I think it was a great suggestion um, to um, look on to Scandinavia um, Ireland's now the worst in the climate change index in Europe and something that we should um, definitely focus on. Uh, I mean, um, in terms of the future, more or less social cohesion. I agree with the white paper on that. We need to do more things together. I don't think we need to use the deal. Um, is that said a good thing in terms of if we want peace, it should be peace among everyone. We're all on the same page um, and moving at the same pace towards the right direction. I mean, I know there's an expression the check is in the post. I think when it comes to climate change, the bill is in the post. And very soon we're going to have to cough up for um, Professor John Sweeney of um, Maynooth University, who has described us as derelict in our duty and has continually done ring the bell. He's actually in Bonn at the moment, once again, continuing to do it, even though he's supposedly retired, but is campaigning on it. So I absolutely agree with you on that one. And just one last turn to the audience. Is there any other comments? Just in the way that Ireland has been viewed in Europe, we, we have a lot of positives coming for us. And I found this both meeting Europeans coming here and travelling in different parts of Europe. There's a very positive attitude towards Ireland. Yeah, leave aside the, the Apple tax thing for a minute. Yeah. We heard from um, a former Europe, uh, UK <coughs> European minister here in Maynooth a week or two ago, and he confirmed that that going around Europe there is a, a positive attitude. I, I think part of it is because obviously we, were ne we never colonised anybody. Mm -hmm. Our record in the UN in relation to peacekeeping has been exemplary in most cases. Um, and I think that, that possibly the, the whole thing of Irish neutrality, we need to move away from the old, the old idea of what, what kicking the brakes is. <coughs> And, and start looking more positively towards how we can help in the common defence of Europe. Um, but I, I do think if, if Ireland advertised for friends, they'd have people queuing outside the station store. <laughs> I'd like to thank our people for so bravely standing forward, and I'd ask John to come up now and just make some closing remarks. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul. You were going so bad until you mentioned Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, when you asked, are there any Danes here? They're all probably still out bloody well celebrating. So, um, I really want to thank our uh, six student panel members. I thought their remarks were really illuminating, uh, really interesting, and I think it was wonderful for once to reverse the equation and have the experts up here uh, rather than uh, down there listening to people like me who are usually winging it uh, a lot of the time. I mean, one of the things that comes through so importantly is uh, that of communicating Europe. There are enormous deficits of communication at national level in particular, at EU level as well, but particularly at national level. And so I really welcome the Minister's uh, Citizens Initiative. I hope that uh, it takes place on a regular basis right throughout the country in multiple kind of platforms, because the more we converse about these issues, uh, the very better, the, the, the better would be the better for it. I first went to a meeting with the theme bringing Europe closer to the citizens 20 years ago in the run-up to the Amsterdam uh, Treaty referendum. And I never thought actually that those who were running these events were very serious, either in Brussels or in Dublin. But now I think there's been a change. And it really struck me yesterday looking at 
the minister's launch of the Citizens' Dialogue, that there's a generational change that's taking place. Helen McEntee is 31 or 32, uh, the Taoiseach is 38 or 39, no longer the youngest Prime Minister in Europe, but that's significant, and uh, Minister Coveney similarly. So they're all people that have actually, I think, internalised Europe from school days or from university days onwards. <coughs> Uh, it's worth remembering Erasmus has been a big part of that. We really value our Erasmus students uh, here. When I teach European Union politics, uh, you know, people who come in through Erasmus make a fantastic contribution. We learn all kinds of things about the way things are processed and internalized everywhere. We should also remember that the Erasmus program has been responsible for, would you believe it, three million babies that have been born since 1989. Uh, this is astonishing statistics. <laughs> Interdependence, interpenetration, I don't know what the track is, but uh, this has produced things that are really, really important. I was really struck also by our colleague from the school next door who went on about the schools and the point you make about civic education, which others have made as well. Really important, something we've done really poorly over the years in Ireland in general, but especially on Europe. Now that is changing actually at the, uh, the Blue Star programme, which the European movement is involved in at primary school level. I was delighted to hear you mention the European Parliament programme. The politics and society syllabus now, uh, which has kind of come out of the civic and social political education, that's really promising as well. The part of it on the EU is really well thought through and written. And if that's rolled out on a more serious <coughs> basis, that should also, I think, begin to make a difference. And there's also a role for individuals. If you join a political party, you should ensure, I think, that there is a European focus to activity and discussions. Uh, if you're part of a political party at university, uh, you get to be part of the wider European family, if it's Fine Gael through the EPP, uh, if it's um, uh, Labour through the Socialists and Democrats, and so on. Uh, so all of that, I think, is really important in that civic sense, people taking responsibility as well as expecting government uh, uh, to do the communicating. Uh, the second point, uh, the final one, um, uh, a number of speakers mentioned the need for Ireland to be serious about its European vocation and to be part of the core of European uh, Union politics. I think that's really important. I'm sick to death of hearing arguments about Ireland being on the periphery and especially once Britain leaves, we're going to struggle. Uh, that's not the case any longer. I don't think it was particularly the case 20 years ago. We're in an entirely different position economically, and we should be at the core with the Netherlands, with Denmark and in other countries, uh, and with France and Germany, as, as somebody put it, I think it was Anastasia, actively helping to shape the agenda of the European uh, Union of the future. And that also, I think, is important in respect of alliances. It's anybody's guess as to how we're going to do in the Council without Britain. Uh, Paul rightly pointed out there are no permanent alliances within the Council. We uh, really do align very closely with France on agriculture and not with Britain historically. But that is changing, and so our relationships with uh, small states, such as the Baltic states uh, and others, I think, are going to be uh, crucially important. So I want to thank everybody, uh, both here on the panel and in the audience for coming along, for contributing to such an incredibly vibrant conversation. The first, I hope, of many that I'm going to be at uh, in the months and years to come with Europe at the centre. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Barry Andrews and his colleagues, Hannah DC uh, and Fanula and others, who have, at relatively short notice, helped to put this event together. Uh, it's uh, been a pleasure to work with you as always. You do fantastically good work and we really appreciate it. And actually, where we can actually combine uh, and co-host things, I think that's a very useful part of this, uh, the way we might process Europe in the future. I also want to thank Paul for giving us time as uh, RTE operative that's the best word. Uh, he is hugely busy all the time and he's given us also the benefits of his career in Brussels, the time he spent as a foreign correspondent in Ukraine, Bosnia and elsewhere. So thanks very, very much indeed for agreeing to facilitate, Paul. And I want to thank everybody who's come uh, today just to listen and to partake and to participate. So thank you all very, very much indeed.